Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game Mexica by Super Meeple and Yellow Games. When the Aztecs began building the great city of Tenochtitlan, they became known as the Mexica. You are a Pillai Mexica, a great noble, and you hope, through your efforts in shaping the city, that you'll rise to a high office at the emperor's side. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the middle of the table and shuffle the 15 Capuli tokens. I'm going to refer to these as district tokens for the rest of the video and reveal eight of them at random, placing them in this area that represents the emperor's demands. It will help during gameplay if these are arranged in ascending order based on the large yellow number. Set the remaining seven district tokens unrevealed nearby along with the bridge pieces and action point tokens. These are the canal tiles, which should also be placed nearby. And then you take two of the two space canals and put them on this matching area of the board like so. Players should now choose one of the four colors and collect the matching colored pieces, which include the temples, Pillai Mexica, or Noble, as I'll call them from now on, and a prestige point marker. These markers should be placed on the zero space of the prestige track, which goes around the outside of the board. Two player games are set up slightly differently and we'll discuss that at the end of the video, but I'm setting up a three player game. So for now, I'll just return these color pieces to the box. Each player also receives a double sided player aid. Flip it to this side and pay attention to the top half section. This tells you which temple pieces you'll start the game with. Your remaining temple pieces will be used in the second half of the game, so keep them nearby, but separate. You can also flip your player aid over as this side is more helpful during the game. The game is begun by the oldest player, who will choose one of these four spaces of the Emperor's Palace to place their noble on. In clockwise order, the rest of the players will choose from the remaining spaces. And that's the setup. In Mexico, players will be carving up the island with canals to create and found districts of specific sizes as requested by the emperor, because doing so will give you prestige. You can also gain further influence by building your temples in those districts. And as we'll see, crafty nobles can even get credit for work that other players have done. The game is played over two periods, and in the first period, players are collectively trying to satisfy the eight requests of the emperor and build their own starting temples. In a period, players will take turns in clockwise order, starting with the first player. On your turn, you will gain six action points to spend, which are shown here on your player aid. Each of these red dots represents an action point. And you can spend these on any of the actions as illustrated here, most showing a cost and some being free. You can even repeat actions as often as you like, as long as you have the points to spend. But points you don't spend are lost. So let's begin by learning the first action shown here, constructing canals. At the start of the game, the island is one large district, which is surrounded by a lake and made up of the squares that we see here, excluding the four canal spaces already on the board. By adding canals, we begin to carve up the island into smaller districts. A district is formed when it's fully surrounded by water. So now the island has two districts, one really large one, and this smaller one made up of four squares. It's okay if the bordering water or canals are only touching on the diagonals like we see here. And a district can be further carved up by placing even more canals. It's also worth mentioning that all of the canal pieces work the same way. The boats pictured on some of them are just for artistic purposes. So for this action, a player can spend one action point to place any canal, single or double, anywhere on the board. Their noble does not have to be nearby. Basically, they're sending out their people to do the work. There are some restrictions to placing canals. First of all, you can't put them on any of the five spaces that make up the emperor's palace, or on top of another canal, or on a piece of the lake. You also can't place them on either land space adjacent to a bridge's ramps, so you couldn't place it like this. We'll see how bridges get placed a little bit later. Also, once a district is founded, which we'll see is indicated with one of these tokens, further canals cannot be placed within it. However, if it has not been founded yet, any player is able to reshape it. So how do we found a district? Well, we can find that action here at the bottom of the player aid, and you can see that it doesn't cost an action point to do, but there are two conditions. First, your noble must be in one of the land spaces of the district you're founding. 
This is too important an occasion to be off somewhere else. And a district token must be available in the list of the emperor's demands. That's these tokens here, whose yellow number matches the number of spaces enclosed by the lake and or canal pieces. If this is true, then you can take that token and place it in any of the empty land spaces of that district. Now this district size can no longer be modified by adding new canals. Furthermore, this token cannot be moved, built upon, or even walked into by the nobles. The noble who founds a district immediately gains prestige equal to the blue value shown here on the left. And if any other players also have nobles in the district at the moment that it's founded, they also each gain points equal to the lesser value shown here on the right. And keep in mind, you can found a district that somebody else spent their time working on. You just have to have your noble there and take the action to found it before they do. So you might want to be careful about how close you get to finishing a district if you don't have the action points left to finish and found it, especially if there's other nobles lurking around. You can found a district surrounding the palace. It's five spaces, will count towards the district total, but you can't place the token on any of those five spaces that would deface the palace and anger the emperor. For a single action point, a player can also construct a bridge. Because they're sending their workers off to do this job, their noble figure does not have to be in the place where the bridge is constructed. In fact, it can be put on any canal space of the board with a few conditions. First, the steps of the bridge must both face adjacent land spaces, but the land spaces don't have to be empty. This means you could have a temple, district token, or even a player piece, temporarily or permanently blocking access to the bridge. Two bridges can be placed side by side, but not so that they form a chain. Because again, both sides of each bridge's steps must touch land. In this case, in the middle, they're both touching water. This also means that bridges can't lead into the lake either. Once all 11 bridge pieces have been put into play, then when taking the build a bridge action, you take a bridge already in play that doesn't have a player on it and put it anywhere you want following the usual rules. Remember, you can only do this once all bridges are in play, and you cannot use this action to simply remove a bridge. The next action is shown on two lines, and it's building a temple. The cost will be equal to the height of the temple, which is also shown on the pieces themselves at the top. You can see here, one dot means one action point, two dots, two action points, and so on. Temples can be built in any empty space of a district, whether it's been founded or not, so long as your noble is in the district as well. On the map right now, we have one large unfounded district and a smaller one right here. So as an example, the red player could spend two action points to put a temple here, or here, or here. On the black player's turn, they could spend three action points to put this temple anywhere on these spaces here, but not on the token and not on the space where their figure currently is. Once placed, temples cannot be moved or removed, and temples can't be placed on top of other temples or on any of the palace spaces. They can, however, be built adjacent to the steps of a bridge. This will block access to that bridge. You can even build temples in ways that would trap yourself or even another player. In which case, the trap noble would have to build a bridge later to escape or even teleport, as we'll see later. But now let's talk about how nobles move. These five lines represent the different ways you can move your noble. All of them cost one action point, except for this one here at the end, which we'll talk about last. First, it costs one action point to move to an adjacent land space or to a bridge. But keep in mind, nobles cannot move diagonally or stop on or pass through a space with another noble, temple, or district token. You can, however, backtrack during a turn. But with those restrictions in mind, it means the black player here is really stuck. They can go to this space, but they can't go diagonally here, they can't pass through this token, and they can't pass through this temple. But they're not permanently trapped, and we'll see how you get out of that sticky situation in just a moment. If you go on to a bridge, you can stop there, and it will prevent other nobles from being able to use it. Because again, you can't pass through other players' pieces. Another way you can move is by boat, but boats are not a separate component in the game. Instead, imagine that boats are waiting at each and every bridge currently on the game board. For one action point, you can leave a bridge and move directly to another bridge as long as they are connected by an uninterrupted line of canals and or using the lake. Canals that are only touching on the diagonal are not considered connected for traveling by boat, so this bridge is not connected to this one. But it is connected to this one here. So for one action point, 
This is a legal move. And remember, you can use the lake as well. Since we can trace a line from this bridge down this canal to the lake and around over to this section of canal and to this bridge, we could go here for a single action point. Now, when moving in this way, you cannot stop until you get to another bridge. You just couldn't hop off the canal, say, right here. Let me move things around a little bit here, and I'll give you another scenario. Now, if we wanted to get to this bridge, we'd have to spend one action point to get over here, and then another action point to get here. If another noble is occupying a bridge on your path, you can still travel and pass under the bridge and keep going but you must still pay one action point for each bridge that you pass. The final way you can move is by teleporting. If you spend five action points, you can move your noble to any empty land space or bridge, which is great for getting somewhere quickly, but also good for escaping being penned in by the other players or buildings and tokens. Remember our figure down here that's trapped, it could spend five action points and for example, go right to here. Speaking of which, it should be mentioned that although it's legal to pen in another player's noble, you're not allowed to do this within the first round of turns. You can also spend an action point to collect an action point token. At most, this can be done twice during a turn to collect two. Although on future turns, you could do it again to collect more. If there are no tokens in the supply, then you can't take this action until some have been returned. And lastly, we have the action that lets you spend action tokens you previously collected. You can spend as many as you want in a single turn, and it's free to do so. When you spend an action token, it goes to the supply, and you gain an action point for that turn. This is in addition to the six you normally have. So buying action tokens lets you defer using an action point in a previous turn to then be able to use it later. So in this example, where a player had saved up three action tokens, they could spend all three of them to get nine action points in a single turn. But this means they gave up three action points in previous turns. So those are all the different types of actions, and players will continue taking turns until the eight district tokens have been used, and at least one player has placed all of their initial nine temples. At that moment, finish taking turns so all players have had an equal number that round, and then score for the first period. This is done by checking the grandeur each player has in each founded district one by one. Grandeur is the total number of levels in temples that each player has within the district. This can be calculated by counting up the number of pips on the tops of their temples. For example, the white player here has two, the red player has a grandeur of one, and the black player has a total grandeur of five in this district. The player with the greatest grandeur within a district scores prestige points equal to the yellow value found on the district token there. The second highest grandeur scores the blue value here, and the third greatest scores the white value here. In the case of a tie, tied players all score the full value for the position they are tied for. So let's go through a couple of examples where we assume these are the temples constructed in a district with this token. And you'll notice I've added back in a fourth player for these examples. We know if players are tied, then they both get full value for the position they're tied for. When you have two players tied for first, they'll each get the 12 points. But then you ignore this second value and instead give the third place score to the player with the second most grandeur and the third place player gets nothing. If three players are tied for first place, they'll each get the 12 points and you ignore giving out the second and third place points. If there is no tie for first, but a tie for second, the first place position will get 12 points, the players tied for second will each get six points, and you don't give out the points for third place. Points gained are adjusted on the prestige track, and the district tokens can be flipped over to remind you which have been scored as you go. Districts that have not been founded, like this one, are ignored, even if there are temples constructed there. But if your noble is standing on one of the four starting spaces of the temple during scoring, gain an additional five points. Once scoring has been completed, you can flip all of the district tokens back over and start the second period. You do this by revealing the remaining seven district tokens, showing the emperor's final demands for the rest of the game. Players should not look at these in advance, but you can probably tell I've prearranged these. Players also collect any temples they set aside during the setup and add them to any temples they have remaining from the first period. The second period is then begun again by the player who started the first period. It's played the same way and will end once the seven remaining tokens have been founded 
and at least one player has played all of their temples. But again, finish that round so all players have had equal turns. Something to keep in mind, in either period, players can discard district tokens from the Emperor's demands. If the players agree, it cannot be satisfied because it's impossible to create a district of that size. Sometimes, because of how the canals have been placed and which ones are remaining, it just won't work out. And that's the case currently with this 13 space district, so I'll remove it. At the end of the second period, score grandeur for all founded districts, including those founded in the first period, just as you did before. But now you also score grandeur in districts that were not founded. We have an example of that right here. Let's take a closer look. If you have the greatest grandeur in an unfounded district, you score points equal to the total number of land spaces there. In this case, we have 18 spaces, and black has the most grandeur, so 18 prestige points are earned. If you have the second most grandeur, as white does, then you score half that amount rounded up. So in this case, nine points for second place. And if you're in third place, you score half the points second place would get rounded up. So red would get four and a half points, which we round up to five. And again, if your noble is on one of the four starting spaces, you gain five additional points. Now the game is over and the player with the most prestige wins. If there's a tie, then the tied player with the most action point tokens remaining wins. If there's still a tie, the tied players all win. I had mentioned there's special rules for setup in a two player game, and we'll go over those now. First, take four level one temples, three level two temples, two level three temples, and one level four temple of a color not being used, and then randomly distribute them on the board at the beginning of the game. These temples cannot be placed adjacent to the lake, and they must be at least four spaces apart. Now, at the end of each period, you'll take these temples into account when scoring spiritual grandeur. Otherwise, the game is played exactly the same. And that's how you play Mexica. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.